again for Sebring family I know that um, many of us are weary 
of the civil unrest and things that we're seeing and the stories uh, in the media and so many of us are just ready to move on uh, but I'm, I'm afraid I've got some bad news for you this this is not a new struggle this is an ongoing struggle and as I've said before during this series I believe that we all need to ask God for an extra measure of grace and humility. And interestingly enough, I think as we continue our series in Daniel uh, this morning, this series that we've titled Unshaken, that this is relevant to us uh, today. I think that Daniel helps us with this idea of perspective and struggle, and particularly as we zoom in on Daniel chapter eight, and I know that how we perceive struggle also informs and shapes how we think about triumph on the other end. And what do I mean by that? Well, I want to call this message an elevated perspective because I believe that that's what Daniel is doing for us throughout this book and particularly in chapter 8. You see, chapter 8 makes up part of the apocalyptic writings of the second half of Daniel and part of the purpose of these apocalyptic writings was and is to elevate our perspective or to elevate the perspective of the people uh, beyond what was going on right then and to help them to see beyond the chaos and the confusion of their earthly reality and to catch a glimpse of a heavenly reality. In chapter 8, there's some pretty weird stuff going on. You've got this vision about a ram and a goat, and they're facing off with each other, and the ram had two horns, but it was destroyed by the goat with the one horn, and then one horn was broken off uh, of the goat, and four new horns grow in its place. And then there was some, another extra one that grew as well, and all this crazy stuff. And I mean, you're, th you're probably thinking, I thought Daniel chose not to defile himself with the king's wine, because he's talking like he's had a few too many. This is crazy talk. And that's just the first half of chapter 8. And then the second half of chapter 8 is the interpretation of what's happening here in the book. So I want to zoom in for the rest of our time on the latter verses of Daniel 8 because we don't have time to go through all the nuances and, and read through it in, in its entirety. But I do want to encourage you uh, to do that. So I just want to pick up in verse 23. Uh, which begins in the latter part of their reign. Now, the reign that Daniel is talking about is the reign of these kingdoms because these horns were part of the goat and they represent a kingdom. So verse 23, in the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce looking king, a master of intrigue will arise. He will become very strong but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper and he will consider himself superior. When they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed but not by human power. Now let me skip down to verse 27. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. And then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Is anybody else seeing things that are leaving them feeling worn out? like Daniel. There are so many things that we could zoom in on here, historical, literary, theological, but this morning I just want to lift up three things for us. And these things, I think, just like they spoke to the people in that current crisis that Daniel and, and these people were going through, I think that they speak to us as well, both personally, whatever we're going through, and collectively, what we're going through right now as families, as a church, as a community, as a nation, 
So the question is, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to give the, the message this title, An Elevated Perspective. What is an elevated perspective? What is the elevated perspective that Daniel is trying to give us? Well, here are three things for your consideration. Number one, and this is very simple, but very significant. Evil is real. Evil is is real. If you've ever taken the Alpha course, you know that in week eight we talk about that. When we look at the landscape of our world in our lifetime as we study history, there is this ever-present darkness, a diabolical force at work in the earth. And I'm not sure how any logical or rational person can look at the world, can see the things that have happened and that are happening, and not see evil present in the world. The riots, the killings, the lootings, the burnings, you, you could see them every night if you turn on the news. Things like sex trafficking, mostly children taken by force, many times out of their own country to become sex slaves. They are taken out of their country to make it even more difficult to find them, to track them down. Or we can look at things from history like the transatlantic slave trade. People think that slavery ended in 1865. You want to know how many slaves there were worldwide, not just the United States, worldwide in 1860. There were 25 million. And would you like to know how many slaves there are in the world worldwide right now, today? 27 million. And that doesn't even include the 152 million child laborers. And as moral beings, we have the arrogance to think we're actually making progress. All of this is a product of evil in the world. But here's the thing. Talking about evil is very uncomfortable for us. We don't even like to acknowledge it. And sometimes I think it's because we have this false sense of what evil is. Now, I remember growing up loving Tom and Jerry. I don't know if you knew this or not, but the creator of Tom and Jerry just actually died this past April. That was one of my favorite cartoons. And I'll never forget, there was this one time where this little devil with red horns and a tail was poking Tom. He had a little pitchfork. And there are all of these images that maybe we've grown up with. But I love what Mark Turnage said. He said, we must understand that evil is part of the biblical world view. Jesus was himself confronted by the evil one. He is tempted in, in Matthew chapter 14. He says to his disciples, watch and pray so that you don't fall into temptation from the evil one. And then in Luke 22, he says to, to Peter, he says, the evil one desires to have you, Peter, but I have prayed for you. So this vision in chapter 8 that Daniel has is describing a natural struggle that's going on. And part of the natural struggle that Daniel and his contemporaries are experiencing, it was real oppression that they're facing. But by using apocalyptic language, Daniel is telling his audience that this is really a supernatural struggle. So Daniel is elevating the current struggle to where the fight really is. His vision of the ram and the goat and the horns being destroyed and then another one and another horn growing, they represented the struggle between kingdoms and darkness. And we read the first half of Daniel 8 that, that, that daily sacrifice was taken away from God's people. And there really was a desecration of the temple in Jerusalem. All of this was really, really bad. But what Daniel is showing his contemporaries and showing us with this vision that, that what was really going on was so much bigger than the present day struggle unfolding before their eyes. It wasn't to minimize the struggle that they were in, but it was to give them that elevated perspective, that big picture, that 30,000 foot view of the evil that they were up against. And what does that mean for us? It means for us that the struggle is way bigger 
than liberal versus conservative. It's so much bigger than that. The struggle is bigger than this political or economic or racial struggle. And I'm not minimizing those struggles. I'm not suggesting that we should not be engaged with these things because they have an impact on us. They affect us. God is calling us to engage, but we must understand that there is an elevated perspective, a bigger perspective picture. I love the way that Paul writes about this to the Christians in Ephesus. He says in chapter 6 verses 12 and 13, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand your ground, and after you have done that, you continue to stand your ground. Paul is saying, hey, there is a war going on. There is a struggle going on, but it's in a different realm, and we need to be aware of that. He says the day of evil will come. So evil is real, and we have to understand where the real fight is. So the first thing I want to highlight for us, uh, as Daniel was trying to help us to have an elevated perspective, is that evil is real. The second one is this, is that even God's people will suffer. And that's a tough one for us. And Daniel 8 24 says the kingdoms will even cause suffering for the holy people. Now many, many people of faith or many people who have engaged with faith, they lose it or they stumble at this simple question, why do bad things happen to good people? Suffering often causes us to reevaluate what we believe. It's a perspective shifter for us. And this is the same crisis of faith that Daniel's contemporaries were having because unlike the prophecies of Jeremiah, of Isaiah, and Amos, and others, those prophecies were simply, if I, if I could just summarize it, hey, be righteous, turn from your wicked ways, do the right thing, and you won't experience the wrath of God. But the problem for Daniel and his contemporaries is that they were facing evil or they were facing things that they didn't necessarily bring upon themselves. I think many of us are under the false impression that our goodness somehow blocks suffering. That somehow, because I'm a good person, whatever that means, because I'm a good person, because I keep my nose clean, uh, that, I ha that that acts as an invisible force field around me, protecting me from suffering. I hate to break it to you, but that doesn't work. And so when suffering comes, it causes us to have a crisis of faith. I love the way Pastor Jordan Rice of Renaissance Church in New York City says it. He says, sometimes we don't have faith in God, we have faith in what we want God to do. And that's a big difference. And he goes on to say that suffering burns off the impurities of our faith. You know, I was thinking about this from a parent's perspective. You know, you, you all know that we have three older boys, all in college now, and three younger ones. So basically, we've got two sets. But the older ones, on the very rare occasions when they need it, Allison and I discipline them in a very different way from the younger ones because, you know, they're older and, and, and they should know. Now, all I'm trying to do is elevate their perspective. But they oftentimes think that the things I have them doing is persecution. And that's not real persecution. But I'm just trying to help them understand how decent, uh, functioning human beings, I, I just want them to be able to grow up and be responsible adults that can take care of themselves if and when they ever move out of the house. I'm trying to help elevate their perspective. The little things that I'm pointing out and the little things that I'm harping on, we're trying to help them understand become big things down the road. I'm elevating their perspective. But sometimes they think they're really suffering. <laughs> but here's the thing about suffering. Sometimes when we're in the moment of suffering 
or when we're in the moment of persecution and the things are happening to us that we don't have the capacity to fully understand it. Sometimes we have to be further removed from it to fully understand what is happening or to gain clarity from it. And that's why the, the Apostle Paul said to the believers in Rome, he said in Romans 8:18, 8, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy of comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. There are some things that we just don't understand in the moment, but the glory of God will be revealed in our lives if we allow suffering to do what it's meant to do. So the first thing that I believe that Daniel's trying to do is elevate our perspective about evil. Evil is real. Secondly, that God's people will suffer. And finally, eventually God will prevail. So there's several kingdoms represented in this vision that Daniel is seeing. There's the ram, which is represented the Persian Empire, that's Iran and Iraq and Syria and parts of Egypt. And then you had Greece with the big horn, which represented Alexander the Great. And then Alexander dies at the height of his power. And then his four generals basically split up uh, his power and, 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 his, and his empire and his kingdom. And this is why you have these four different horns. And then you had this little fifth horn that grew up as well. And it said that the fifth horn prospered in everything that it did, throwing truth to the ground. So you have all of these kingdoms that were dominant at one time. They had power. And we see all throughout the Old Testament that there were several kings, his, uh, kingdoms historically who went against God pe God's people and we saw the terrible things that happened. But then out of all of these kingdoms, with all of these powers, comes Rome. The greatest power but even the mighty Roman Empire eventually crumbled under the weight of its own sin and pride and excess and brutality. But notice what Daniel says in verse 25. He says, he will be broken, though not by human power. Friends, we can take comfort in the fact that no matter what happens, God's got this. God is in control. He has our backs and he will bring an end to wickedness. This was the message that Daniel was trying to send to his people. And this is the thing that I like. We're not just left behind, empty-handed, powerless bystanders in this cosmic supernatural battle, but we also have access to supernatural weaponry ourselves. Listen to what Paul says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10 verses 3 and 4. He says, for though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. You know what that means? That means if we're going to, if we're really going to be able to stand firm, if we are really going to be able to fight against evil, if we are really going to be able to, to, to persevere, guess what economic power is going to do for us? We can have all the money in the world and it won't defeat evil for us. Do you know what it also means? It means that public policy and legislation will not defeat evil. These things will help us to address problems, certainly will. We need to be engaged in that way, it's important. But we must understand it is not going to help us defeat evil because we don't wage war as the world wages war. So we've got to tap into and to access the power that we have in God through Jesus. Let me wrap this up real quick for us this morning like this. Up to this point, we've been walking through the entire book of Daniel. Now we're in Daniel chapter 8, right? Daniel has already been through so much at this point. I mean, he and his people have been exiled to a foreign land. They've been forced to serve foreign kings who care nothing about their God. They care nothing about their traditions. There's an attempted assassination against Daniel's friends. You know, this is real persecution, not wash the dishes, take out the trash, and make your bed. This is real. And Daniel himself has experienced the same deal in the lion's den, people conspiring against him. 
And then just weird stuff like being at a party somewhere and this hand starts writing on the wall and Daniel's asked to interpret it and he's interpreting dreams and then he's having all these crazy visions. I'm just trying to put myself in Daniel's position right now. This had to have been weighing on him significantly. And I think we know that it did because we read in the last verse of chapter 8, verse 27, and it really encouraged me, and I hope it encourages you to listen to what Daniel says. He says, in verse 27, I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days, and then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. Daniel is like, this is just too much for me, and he was exhausted. And you know what? I think we're going to find ourselves in situations and circumstances, and maybe that is right now for you. We are worn out, and we are exhausted. But at some point, some way, somehow, we have got to get up and carry on with the king's business. Yes, Daniel takes time to rest and recover, but he gets up and he carries on with the king's business. And I'm trying to figure out how in the world can you just get up and carry on with the king's business with all this crazy stuff going on. And I think the only way that Daniel could do it to have this kind of resolve is that he has an elevated perspective. He sees the big picture. He sees the 30,000 foot view. He understands that the things that are happening in the natural are a reflection of a bigger struggle that is going on. There are other things that are happening outside of his own power so he can step back and have the right perspective and then can proceed in the right manner. And so for those of us who are followers of God and believers in Jesus, we have to have an elevated perspective with all the things that are going on right now, with everything that is happening in our world and being in the middle of a pandemic. And yes, it's exhausting. It's frustrating. And we don't know when it's going to end. But God can sustain us because we have that elevated perspective. And that's my prayer for you this morning, that we understand the struggle is beyond where we are right now, that there is a greater struggle going on. So I'm asking God to give us strength as we navigate our personal and our collective struggles together. Would you pray with me, please? God, I just come before you this morning thanking you so much for the life of Daniel and for all that he experienced and was able to capture, not only for his people to give them an elevated perspective, but to give us in 2020 who desperately need an elevated perspective as well, to help us to understand where the real struggle is and to help us to understand what the real fight is and to understand that we may even suffer But you are all powerful and you will, you will bring us victory. And we thank you that we can lean and depend and trust you and help us to have the right perspective as we move forward. In Jesus' name, amen.
So as we come to the Lord's table today, uh, we hope that you've had an opportunity to uh, gather your elements at home uh, in advance and join us as we celebrate this special meal. Every time we gather around this table, it is our custom as people called Methodists that we receive an offering uh, for those who are in need or some special project. And we're all right now very mindful, even with all of the violence and the rioting and the civil unrest going on, that there are uh, innocent victims of natural disasters who are suffering at this time. And so the uh, offering this month will go to help uh, relieve the suffering of those who've been affected by Hurricane Laura. So we want to invite you to give and to give generously. If you give through the church app, uh, there will actually in the drop down menu uh, be uh, uh, an option for you to select a communion offering. And again, this month, it will go to help the victims of Hurricane Laura. And so Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him and seek to grow into his likeness. Let us draw near with faith, make our humble confession, and prepare to receive this holy sacrament. Let us pray. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own goodness, but in your unfailing mercies. We are not worthy that you should receive us, but give your word, and we shall be healed through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were still sinners. That is proof of God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth, you made us in your image to love and to be loved. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. By the suffering, death, and resurrection of your only Son, Jesus Christ, you delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, wherever we may be, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now let us join together in saying the family prayer of all Christians. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The body and blood of Christ given for you. Let us pray. Most bountiful God, we give you thanks for the world you have created, for the gift of life, and for giving yourself to us in Jesus Christ, whose holy life, suffering, and death, and glorious resurrection have delivered us from slavery to sin and death. We thank you that in the power of your Holy Spirit, you have fed us in this sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of your heavenly banquet. We are your children, and yours is the glory now and forever, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For these past many weeks now, we've been blessing one another with the grace at the end of our time of worship. I'd like to say it a little bit differently this way, and, and some translations translate the word fellowship into communion. And so since we receive communion, let's say it that way uh, together today. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.